What happens in the sky affects life down here on Earth. The celestial compass shows you how and guides your way with astrology you can use from professional astrologer Kathy Beal. Every episode features her light-hearted practical forecasts and navigational tips, blended with humor, optimism, and a love of patterns, symbolism, and pop culture references. Kathy translates technicalities into concepts that apply to real life. You'll learn how the current moment ties to where we've been, from the recent past to cycles that last happened years ago, and get a look at where we're heading and much more, from special topics to special guests. The Celestial Compass, enlightening, entertaining, and empowering. Here's your host, Kathy Beal. Greetings, Earthlings. It's Kathy Beal of EmpowermentUnlimited.net. Uh, we are going to start with a brief update of what's going on in October. Remember that for the full forecast, you can see my Astro Insight at omtimes.com and also at my site, empowermentunlimited.net. Uh, lots and lots going on in October. We begin with one planet stationing direct, and then another. we end with another planet stationing retrograde. So we are wrapping up the Mercury retrograde retrograde that has been uh, roiling many of us uh, and that it's stationing direct uh, at the very beginning of the month uh, at the very end of the month Mars will start a retrograde in Gemini which will feel again like a Mercury retrograde only on steroids because it will involve machinery like crazy and things coming at us from multiple multiple directions uh, both of these have the opportunity for do-overs, for finding information that maybe you didn't deal with exactly right, for learning a lot about what has been going on in the background, and for redoing a lot of things. Um, in the middle of this, two really big events to watch for. One is also at the beginning of October, one last long stress test that's a continuation of something that has been going on since the beginning of 2021, old ways slamming against new ways, demands for structure on innovation, uh, Saturn squaring Uranus. It's exact as it's as exact as it's going to get on the fourth, but they'll be staying really close together until the 12th. So you can see the first two weeks of October having a lot to do with revisiting issues that you've been challenged to deal with structure differently over the last couple of years and get one last chance to get some things in a new order. Likely it's going to affect your circle of friends. And the other big thing to watch for is the new moon at the end of the month on the 25th is a solar eclipse at the beginning of Scorpio. And this is going to launch a um, big cycle of clearing out things in your life that don't really support you in terms of your the value of your resources and your own talents and causing a lot of a reset of your investments which include time money and energy and all of this is the lead into Halloween which is what we're getting a head start on in today's program. I am really thrilled. Um, we're talking today with the authors of A Haunted History of Invisible Women, Ghost Stories About Women, Leanna Ren Renee Heber and Andrea Janes, both of whom I know through a wonderful, wonderful endeavor, or I've had contact with, they probably wouldn't recognize me, um, Andrea founded a marvelous walking tour company in New York City called Burrows of the Dead, which have a kind of um, macabre feel and uh, just an otherworldly feel to the walking historical walking tours that they lead. And Liana is a tour guide, and that's how I found out about this book. I was on one of her tours through Central Park about the mysticism inherent in it and learned. And so they have written um, this fantastic, fascinating collection of stories that 
explore the history behind America's female ghosts, the stereotypes, myths, and paranormal tales that swirl around them, and what their stories reveal about us and why they haunt us. Welcome, Liana and Andrea. Hi, thank Thanks you. I'm really, really thrilled about this. Um, could you start with what the appeal is of ghost stories? <laughs> it's funny because I'm literally right now looking at an article that's an excerpt of one of our book chapters called The Unstoppable, Fearsome, Delicious Allure of the Witch. I was thinking about the allure of the witch, and I like, tell me about the allure of the ghost. Um, and by the way, I think I would recognize you, Kathy. I think you were on my spiritualist tour of Greenwood Cemetery, too. But anyway, whatever. Uh, the endless allure of the ghost. Oh, Liana, where do we even start with this? Well, I always talk about how ghosts, in some ways, of any paranormal entity, ghosts are frankly the most intimate because we could become them. They are of us. They are often of our loved ones. They're very relatable. And they also speak to the yearning to know what lies beyond the confirmation of some kind of life after death, which it really is. They're part of the big existential question of life. And I find that that goes through every single tour that we lead. We end up dealing with lots of existential questions. And Andrea and I have talked before about being sort of paranormal chaplains. I mentioned that in my introductory chapter where I'm kind of holding people's own paranormal experiences with ghosts and spirits in my heart when they share them with me. Um, almost in the sort of a confessional moment, but it's, but it's lovely, and people just want to be reassured. Um, are ghosts, can ghosts sometimes be scary? Yes, they are, they are by their very nature sort of entities of startle and shock because they don't operate on the same levels that we do corporeally, but they really speak to the great unanswered question about the undiscovered country. And I have noticed that there's something about the way you present this in person, or maybe it's just the nature of the stories, but I, I suspect that you're a part of this too, that inspires people to pull you aside afterwards and tell you their stories. <laughs> like, tell me absolutely. I'm not crazy. I exp yeah. Absolutely, exactly right. It's exactly right. It's, it's a tell me I'm not crazy. And, it, and sometimes people are just excited to share because like I, we, both Andrew and I present a very open-minded and open forum by which to have discussions with us. Yeah, absolutely. Kind. People definitely will share their stories, and their stories are, <clears throat> I think Liana had kind of used this word right off the top, intimate. They, they really are. These are quite intimate details of people's lives, homes, families. And, um, yeah, I think the way that we present the material on our tours, we always are very respectful and very open-minded. And I think we definitely create a, you know, quote-unquote safe space for people to share details about themselves and their lives that they may not otherwise. So, yeah, and that's actually, for me, is the one of the most rewarding parts of the job is, is creating that connection with people and, and, you know, being privileged to share their stories. It's amazing. So what, what, act, what specifically inspired the two of you to write this book? How did you come up with uh, the idea? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was kind of this wonderful thing where um giving the tours themselves has created an environment where people will bring not only stories but people will bring opportunities to us so i i've been in the publishing industry for a, a decade um i have 16 uh well, 15 uh 16 next year 15 fiction novels out and so an editor that I know was on, was taking one of my tours and she said, you know, I love your fiction, but, and all my fiction has ghosts in them. So it's, you know, <laughs> ghosts are sort of my main, my main squeeze as it were. And um, so she pulled me aside after the tour and said, you know, you really should do a book about ghost stories. And um, I thought, okay, I would love to do that. But I really felt that anything that was coming out of a tour that I was giving is being informed by the choices and the core level of respect and the storytelling styles that Andrea has lifted up with the company. So I really didn't feel comfortable going forward with a book modeled off of the type of tour that we were giving without bringing Andrea into the process 
And I wanted to do that because I have always loved how her core of respect for the for the spirits and history exactly matches mine. We may differ a little bit in our levels of skepticism versus not skepticism, but at the, the core being respect, that's the most important thing. Everything else is just a little bit of sort of spiritual semantics. So, you know, uh, I knew that this was something that she also wanted to do. So we were, we were raring to go right out of the gate. Um, the framing of women's ghost stories coincided with a tour that Andrea was already starting to give. Andrea, do you want to talk about Yeah, about sure. the onset of the tour? Yeah. So I actually, I have to give some credit to another writer, a woman who is a freelance writer named Gabrielle Moss, or Gabrielle Moss. And she had actually emailed me out of the blue many years ago, saying I'm writing an article about why women are uh, that would go. And I was like, hmm, okay. Um, let's do this. Let's see what's up. So as I was, you know, interviewing with this woman for this article, it reinforced and it, and it made me kind of occur to me in the first place and reinforced this pattern I had noticed on my tours, which is um, we get a lot of female identifying customers. <clears throat> in fact, the majority of our customers were women. And I was like, hmm, that is something. Maybe there is something to this. After all, the article, by the way, that I'm looking it up is um, in Bustle. It's called I Went to a Haunted Hotel to Find Out Why Women Are So Obsessed with Seeing Ghosts. And that writer was uh, Gabrielle Moss. And so after doing that interview and after kind of thinking about it and letting it percolate for a while, I started to think about the connections between women and ghosts and, and, you know, what that all meant. And eventually I started to realize that there was actually a lot to these patterns and to these connections. And there were also several stops on our ghost tours that were about female ghosts. So I created this tour called Ghostly Women of Greenwich Village. And Ghostly Women of Greenwich Village was a huge success. People loved it. And, like, it was weird. Like, it was covered in the New York Times and stuff. And everybody was like, wow, cool. This is New York City's only feminist ghost tour. And I was like, oh, wow, the feminist ghost tour. Cool, I remember that. So when Leanna and I started to sit down with editors after she was approached for this initial concept, like a book about New York City ghosts, we started, like, you know, spitballing ideas, and one of the ideas was, like, maybe it's about female New York City ghosts, right? Like, the tour, and one thing led to another, and we expanded it outside of New York City, and then it became national, and then before we knew it, it was a book about female ghosts in American lore. Um, and then this wonderful editor that we started to work with got the brilliant idea of categorizing these ghost stories by tropes. You know, instead of organizing them geographically or whatever, we are organized thematically by tropes. So these archetypal roles that women have played throughout the years, um, you know, the maiden, the mother, the witch, the quote-unquote mad woman. Um, and these were very useful tropes for helping us organize the stories and also for helping us, you know, think about ghosts in the sense of how do they reflect feminine roles as defined by society. So then that's it. And that's how we kind of came up uh, with the idea for this book. And... You specifically explore, it It seems to me, the impact on, I don't even know how to put this, that sometimes being a ghost can bestow agency on a woman or grant her a voice in a way. So there's like a sociopolitical viewpoint. Um, you, you, you say specifically... This book is an exploration of what ghosts and hauntings tell us about ourselves and about the historical role of women. And it seems to me you make a point of showing how in life some women were not able to do what their ghosts have pulled off. Is, is that an overstatement? No, I mean, no, I, 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 yeah. So that in life, women are often silenced and ignored, and the ghost has this incredible staying power where she cannot be ignored, and, and you cannot get rid of her. She's there, haunting you. Absolutely, and, and the, the presence of the ghost very often will allow a historical museum or visitors to explore more about her life. She's much more famous being a ghostly resident of, of a specific location. And very often her presence will be the reason why a house is saved or preserved. Haunted history 
uh, tours and tourism is a big profit driving narrative. Um, I explore some of that in the Sarah Winchester chapter called Unfinished Business, because that house, she didn't leave it to anyone in her will. And it was assessed and deemed of no value. This sprawling, fascinating, mysterious house of 160 rooms that had ready-made lore attached to it, that would have all been torn down had an amusement park company not started the Winchester Amusement Company the year after Sarah Winchester's death. Did they tell wild stories about her to perpetuate the concept of this mystery house? Absolutely. So my chapter is trying to separate fact from fiction, but the narrative itself, even though that was completely fabricated, did save that house. And now I had the opportunity to go to that house and sift through the details and find the truth about who this woman was. And thanks to a brilliant biography by Mary Jo Ignafa called Captive of the Labyrinth, she did a lot of that work of, un- of unpacking these tales because she was also uh, really curious about this lady and was, is any of this true that she built this house because the spirits told her to? No, not, not, not remotely. But is it haunted? Absolutely. It absolutely is. Haunted by the spirits of those who worked there and loved her and loved that house. So it's interesting how the, the agency also becomes entwined with the location that was important to them somehow. And with that, we're going to take our first break. So everyone, hang on. There's a lot more really interesting stuff to come. Welcome back to Celestial Compass. We're talking today with Leanna Renee Heber and Andrea James, author of authors of A Haunted History of Invisible Women. And just before the break, we were talking about uh, the Winchester House, Sarah Winchester, as an example of so many different facets of history and people being caught up in an actual location. So you were saying this, the hauntings aren't really that spirits told her what to do. The legend is that the ghosts of people that the Winchester rifles, rifles killed caused her to build this insane house. But the reality is that she built it and a lot of people loved her and their energies are still there. Is that exactly. an accurate exactly. way of describing it? And yeah, no, I think that was a perfect summation. And, and I think to speak to your question about the agency, um, sort of the truth will out if you, as long as you look for it. And so that's tricky, though, when we're talking about things that have been perpetuated in terms of sort of urban legend and folk and myth. So in some ways we can deal with a reclamation and other times we're trying to kind of find that person. Andrea, do you want to build on that? Yeah, actually, I was thinking of another example of a way that a ghost may have a certain kind of agency um, or a certain kind of a voice or staying power. So another example that crossed my mind was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City. Uh, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that location is still extant. The building itself is still in use um, for another purpose. It's now a New York University building. But, you know, these, these women whose stories have been transmuted into urban folklore and ghostly legend over the years, I mean, this is, a, this is a location that is on every Greenwich Village ghost tour in the city. So, you know, these women loom large in the lore of, of sexual uh, females in our city. And when we approach them, we approach them sort of in the idea that maybe we're not looking necessarily for these apparitional experiences or for thrills and chills. What we're looking for is this idea of, of haunting, of place memory, of an idea that these women were here and that their spirits still live on in a certain sense. And by repeating this story, especially on a ghost tour, which is a very emotionally charged kind of tour, um, we are able to keep them at the forefront of our minds. We're able to continuously remind people of the importance of workers' rights and workplace safety, which is an ongoing conversation, particularly in the garment and fashion industry now. Uh, the conversation must never stop. So these, these women really, <clears throat> um, they, they continue to be an omnipresent reminder that they, they needn't have died, they shouldn't have died, and that women nowadays could maybe be saved if we continue to fight for the things that, you know, killed these women if we can fight against these things. So what I mean is that it's not like the ghost herself has agency and she's a powerful being. It's that they continue to be present in our consciousness, in our memories, in our minds, 
and we continue to care about these things and to hopefully advocate for change in whatever way we can, whether it's, you know, by refusing fast fashion or whatever. So, you know, this is what I mean by there is a power to the go to hunt and continue to keep us on that path, you know, in this particular case to a more just society. So, like, it's a little bit of an abstract concept, um, but, you know, it's there, and, and the, the way that we tell these stories as ghost stories, and it gives me such an emotional resonance and power and a very deep and, and profound reminder that the past is, is always with us and should never be forgotten. So, you know, that's kind of what we mean when we say there's a power to these stories. Some of the stories in your book are do involve women whose names are probably not going to be known to the reader. They're not all New York City centric, so don't worry, people. Uh, they're all over the United States. And, and the one that really got me or grabbed me in the mothers and wives section was Ma Green and her ship. <laughs> Can I you tell her. us about her? <laughs> I adore I adore Ma Green. She's she's so fantastic. So Mary Becker Green in the 19th century um, was the first woman to get a steamboat pilot's license, and she founded Green Line Steamers with her husband. She was always fascinated with the rivers and the waterways. She grew up around the confluence of the Muskegee River and the Ohio River, um, so she was very much in the sort of the tri-state area around Ohio and the neighboring country, uh, the neighboring uh, counties around o around southern Ohio, and so she married a, a, a steamboat captain, and they founded together, and they were co-owners in the 19th century of Green Line steamers, and they just started doing boat tours around the various rivers that would you know tributaries that would lead to the Mississippi, um, and sort of East Coast riverways, and. People just loved Ma. They would buy tickets just for her company. She was this force of nature, and she loved to dance. And she would go dance with you, and then she would go pilot the ship for a while. And so she learned. She just was a sponge about ships. And so she learned how to fix them. She learned how to pilot them. And then when she wasn't piloting or giving birth literally on a steamer, she did, like when it was during an ice jam even, um, you know, like it, it would be like a tall tale if it wasn't completely verifiable that she, you know, really defied the odds and was the first woman in a, in a captain's role. And, and she just as, assumed it with grace and with also with a lot of, 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 of energy and, and people um, would talk about how she would, uh, when she was not um, piloting too, she would also be like sewing curtains for the guest rooms. So she also had this domesticity that was like this comprehensive, everything that a, a woman's role would be sort of expected to do, she was still doing, and she was also doing the captain's role. And so it really was like, you know, she was defying the odds of, oh, well, you can't have it all. You can't have a career and a family or whatever. No, she was doing all of that and expertly, but she hated alcohol. And so people loved going on, people loved her company so much that they would forgo alcohol just to be in her company and to dance the Virginia Reel with her. And then on the Delta Queen, here she was like an octogenarian and she's still on the Delta Queen and she passes away in one of the staterooms of the Delta Queen. She, she died on one of the boats she loved the most and her spirit still haunts that boat. Um, captains have been woken up when something's wrong with a ship because a woman's voice startles them awake or shoves them. There'll be phone <laughs> calls from her stateroom. She's like still watching out over her ship. And the thing that I love the most is that when they were going to put in a bar into her ballroom after her death, when they started construction on it, a barge charged in to and crashed into the side of the Delta Queen right at the bar. And when they dislodged the barge, the name of the barge was the Mary B. Mary Beautiful. Becker Green still <laughs> having her say, don't cross Ma. <laughs> don't mess her. with my ship. <laughs> don't mess with my ship. It was just, so, you know, she's, I mean, so these, these are Cincinnati based ghost stories and I'm from Cincinnati. And so with, you know, with all of these stories about about women who have been in really difficult circumstances, it was really fun to find this firebrand of a lady who is just doing her own thing. 
And and some of the articles about her really do say she paves the way. Other women looked and saw that there was this woman pilot, and it totally opened the doors for women in the fields of navigation across the board. She was a trailblazer. Wow. Yep. Now you have there. The stories are all over the map, geographically and stylistically, uh, in your book. But there's another one that uh, that strikes me that jumps out of someone who didn't necessarily go with the expected norms. And you've actually had contact with this one, and that is what's going on with the Merchants Museum in New York City. Spinsters and Widows chapter. That was a, a whole, yeah. She's so one of our Andrea, jump in on jump in on Gertrude, Andrea. I know how how we love Gertrude. We have known her for years. Um, yeah, I, Kathy, can I ask you what particularly grabbed you about Gertrude? Like, what aspect of her story you loved? I'm always curious to know what makes. Oh her well, the the fact that she, someone who managed her own affairs and estate. And never married. It's the never married part under circumstances where it was really suspect to not be married. Yeah. Or maybe maybe looked down on, okay? Like some, you're lesser than if you don't marry. Right. It, it was an expectation, and people would definitely look at you a bit askance if you chose not to. So for sure, it was. it's funny because just thinking about Ma Green, the, the metaphor, she was captain of her own ship as well. But in this case, Gertrude's ship was a stately brick townhouse in the middle of Greenwich Village. So, um, you know, she, it's funny because the, the story about the reason why she became a spinster really emphasizes the fact that she was in love with a man who her father didn't consider a suitable match. And so as a young woman, she claims that if she couldn't marry this man, she would never love again. And so she spent the rest of her life alone. So the way her story is woven about her as a woman and as a spinster is at you know, she's at the confluence of two men, the lover and the father. And she fakes out a tiny little sliver of agency for herself where she's like, okay, you guys are going to, well, father, you're going to make this decision for me. So I guess the only way that I can kind of reclaim some power for myself is by saying, all right, then I will have no one. And she maintains a kind of steadfast, you know, adherence to her vow. She is really master of her house. She's mistress of her house. Um, she's really, you know, she lives there until she's 93 years old. She's a stalwart fixture in the neighborhood when other people are, are leaving the neighborhood because wealthy New Yorkers, and she was an upper middle class New Yorker, they fled north to Fifth Avenue um, as the century progressed. She was born in 1840, and by the time she died in 1933, uh, almost nobody of her class is living in that neighborhood anymore. She's down on 4th Street by the Bowery. So she's this um, kind of bulwark against change. She really maintains everything exactly as she wishes in the home of which she is the ultimate mistress. And in the end, the home is so much hers. I mean, there were other people in her family who lived there with her, but they really fall by the wayside because the force of Gertrude's personality and her sort of mythos is that it's really seen as her home. And, you know, Leanna and I co-wrote a complex chapter that talks about the different ways she as a spinster is perceived. And, the, you know, at the end of the chapter, we say that obviously Gertrude owned her choices and what one person might deem a lonely life, another might find comforting and well-lived. And there's a freedom and a personal ownership in spinsterhood. And that must be, you know, must be what some people find so truly terrifying about it. While she waits and she watches and she's still present in that house, it is without question the one place that was always and will always be hers. And you have yourself had experiences in this house. Am I correct? We both have. You both have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we have yeah, both we bo had the same spot in the house. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. And, and, it's, and it's not just us, too. People on our tours, um, even just last night uh, on our tour of Ghostly Women of Greenwich Village, people were talking about their experiences in that house. Um, it's, it's the most consistent tour or it's the most consistent tour stop where the experiences are the most consistent. Because sometimes you'll get people who are see you or, or experience different things. Someone might see something, someone might feel something, someone might smell something. But in this case, 
everyone has had a tactile experience of being either brushed or touched or grabbed or in my case like sort of a fond squeeze on my elbow um when i said something very you know uh uh when i i ebulliently um uh, said something to the to the crowd that i was with about how wonderful it was that the house was saved because it was it's this time capsule from eight from you know the 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 gilded age time capsule is is how she kept it and it's there's literally nothing else like it in in any uh historic house um that is kept in that particular literally like a stuck in time moment and so i just you know and, and they almost lost it they almost auctioned everything off out of the house and would have absolutely lost everything um, and so I just sort of shouted out, thank God it was saved <laughs> in the middle of a tour I was taking as a participant. And uh, and I felt this little fond, ice cold grab of my elbow. But it was just this this fond gesture of like, we're so glad you feel the same way. It was felt very familial. Um, so, you know, my my outburst of love about the house actually generated a response. And it was fascinating. And I, I thought it was my friend. <laughs> Who admittedly has bad circulation and freezing cold hands? But, no, no, no. She was she was across the room, and I turned to the beautiful red settee, uh, and, and 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 no one there, and that was quite startling. So yeah, we both have had tactile experiences there. Those are really yeah. startling when you have them. I've had one also someplace else, and, and those who don't experience it sometimes can be very envious of those of us who do, but they're a little unnerving at times, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll have to say. Like, oh, this is not just a joke. All right, yeah, I <laughs> felt that. Well, well. Um, I want to, uh, so there are a number of other things I want to get into. And just so everyone knows, Liana's going to have to leave before the very end of the interview. So let's see, what can I start before we get into the break? Um, you, un you also deal with uh, people who openly play on the, played on the concept of ghosts, fakes. And I'm thinking specifically of Katie King. Yeah, she was an invention. She was a complete invention. And I think, you know, one of the things with this book, we we didn't want to just tell you stories of, okay, here are some female ghosts and not acknowledge that there's a lot of charlatanism in the history of ghost lore and also within the spiritualist movement. There were bad faith actors who were literally actors preying upon people. And, you know, the I, I have met legitimate psychics. A lot of the ones in the 19th century who were putting on big marquee theatrical shows, they were just elaborate stage magicians. And those were the types of people that Harry Houdini debunked through his career because he thought that they were giving, you know, magic a bad name and defrauding people. And they, they very much were. He wouldn't have exposed their acts had they just called themselves magicians. Mm -hmm. So I, for us, it was important to sort of say, okay, now let's talk about the fact that this industry... Um, and it is an industry, has had some folks who are just trying to get one over on somebody. So Katie King was an invention of Florence Cook. In, uh, so at this point, time period-wise, we're, we're in the middle of the, uh, the 19th century. So we're, we're talking like 1860s, 1870s here. Um, and I'm going to interrupt and, you right here for our... Yes. So, hang oh, on, sorry. people. Here's our, our next break, and then you'll hear the rest of what was up with Katie King. Welcome back to Celestial Compass. We're talking ghost stories with Liana Renee Heber and Andrea Jaynes, author of, authors of, I keep screwing that up, A Haunted History of Invisible Women. And just before the break, we were starting to talk about charlatans and fakes and the case of Katie King, who was an invented yeah. character. She was an invented character, and thank you. Yeah, I get so caught up in these things. I'm sorry to run right into your break there, but um, oh no, she, no, she was um, she was a complete invention. Florence Cook was a spiritualist, uh, basically a, a, a she was a showman, <laughs> a show lady who was like you know creating a an invocation of this spirit um, and passing it off to the audience as as something she had summoned, um, and it was basically just an actor in in elaborate stage lighting and you know and and it coming out from a spirit cabinet utilizing trick doors things like that so she got pretty 
uh, she got debunked in London, but in the audience were the <laughs> were were a family who decided, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take this show back to America. We don't know that anybody will have thought to debunk it there. And so Katie King was reinvented in Philadelphia, and she was like the most talked about ghost for a, uh, at least a year until it finally was, um, you know, uh, uh, Nelson and Jenny Holmes were, were finally sort of run out of town, as it were, um, and then they sort of fled court proceedings uh, for fraud. Um, but people really, truly, in the height of spiritualism, were really thinking that, that they were summoning an actual spirit who was coming out of a cabinet and, and speaking with them. And I know that, like, now we think, well, how in the world would you not think that this was an actor? But at that time, people were so desperate for answers. And at a time when, you know, this was, people were still recovering from the, the grief of the Civil War, the, the spiritualist movement was born out of a need to have contact and have some kind of reassurance at a time when still child mortality was very high and women were dying in childbirth a lot. Everyone was very close to death in the 19th century. Epidemics were rife. So, you know, you can understand how the spiritualist movement was really a salve for the time, but the sort of the zeal and the um, almost conspiracy theory level of belief that would go into these sitting circles um, and they would be self-closing, like you could only attend if you were recommended by someone and you could not, um, if you were a disbeliever, you were ejected from the premises. Um, people still fought against that and ended up, do, you know, uh, realizing that, that this this young woman named Eliza was, was the actress embodying um, uh, Florence, uh, Florence Cook's original act. So, um, but just, we want to deal in this book with the concept that um, sometimes the inventions themselves, these urban legends, these myths, these creations of other people, they still have a staying power because for a long time she was believed to be a real spirit. So in that, there is there is a power to that, but it also speaks more to the the need to believe. And that's something we wanted to make sure we, inc- that we included because there is a fine line sometimes between fact and fiction. And we try very hard in the book to walk that line. So we wanted to also give examples of, of things that are at, were absolutely invented. And an outgrowth of that or a companion area of inquiry is the whole notion of commercializing on ghosts, the complicated, you know, ghost tours. And even if things are debunked, they still, people still tell the stories in some cases, sometimes that there's proof. Uh, you do discuss the whole the big tangled knot of ghost tours. Andrea, do you have a, a, anything uh, on that? It is a tangled knot. I was just sort of contemplating, you know, this, this tangled knot and, and this idea of, yes, people, you know, when Hannah said, I can't believe people thought that was real, that Katie King was real. Like, we would look back on that and laugh, um, you know, but people were grieving and people were, were speaking. But also, I think that as a historian and as a ghost tour guide, something important to remember is that the ghost seeking behavior of a lot of people, when we enter into it, <clears throat> I mean, yes, there is like a genuine belief and people do have genuine paranormal experiences. But there's also in the pattern of ghost seeking behavior for the average person, there is an element of willing spectacle is what I'll call it. There is an element of entertainment, an element of spectacle, an element of fun. And I think that it's a little bit disingenuous for modern people to look back on the 19th century and and say, well, you know, God, these people were gullible idiots. I think a lot of them went into it with a sense of curiosity with a sense of fun, looking for a bit of entertainment and spectacle, and they may have gone into a seance looking just for something to do on a Saturday night. And if something cool happened, that was a bonus. But I, I don't know that everybody was completely credulous at all times. And so the same thing happens now on a ghost tour. You know, it's commercialized because it is a spectacle, and it is entertainment, and that is exactly why the knot is so tangled, because unlike a lot of entertainment that's purely fictional, our entertainment has a a basis, however tenuous in some cases, 
in reality and in a person's lived experience. And while some ghost stories are absolute um, humbug or urban legend or folklore and they deal with stock figures, other stories are very real. You know, we'd already talked about the triangle. I have had descendants of survivors whose great-grandmothers worked at the Triangle and, and lived through that day. I have had those people on my tours, and we've talked about those stories. So you know, these are very real to a lot of people. Um, and in terms of commercializing and profiting off of that experience, of somebody's very often tragic, traumatic experience, um, it's really a difficult knot to untangle. I think the best way to approach it now is, you know, with a sense that the, the purveyor of this tour matters, the way they present the information matters, and you, as a consumer, if you care, you can seek out people who are like-minded. You can look for black-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, native-owned businesses, queer-owned businesses, people whose marginalized voices are finally coming back to the forefront. Um, people who are actually affected by the social structures that make a lot of these tragedies happen uh, are finally kind of starting to retell those stories. And when you support them financially by buying a ticket to a tour or buying their book, you're not necessarily like a capitalist monster. You're paying someone a fair wage for a service they're performing, which is telling you a story or giving you historical insights. So I don't I think ghost tourism is inherently evil. I do think that it's complex and that it's a partnership between the person giving the tour and the person taking the tour. Um, the more respectful you can be, the better. And it's really like as a consumer, there's certain things that you can look for and that, and that you can, little signals that will tell you how somebody is approaching the world of the paranormal and the kind of circumstances under which these ghost stories came to be, how, how respectful are they of those particular narratives and of the people involved in them? So you can figure that out as a consumer. Um, and I don't think anyone should feel guilty about taking a ghost tour. I don't think you should feel bad about it. We're not hearing the industry. We're participants in the industry. But there's a way to do it, I think, that really softens the, the whole concept. This leads to the big, complicated issue of Salem. But before we launch into this, because I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a discussion, I just want everyone to know that Liana is going to have to leave, and she may suddenly disappear or say goodbye very quickly. So I just <laughs> want to alert you to this is coming. But Salem is a very complicated situation for so many reasons, and it has become... Uh, mecca for a lot of people, especially at this time of year. I know people who have booked their lodging a year in advance. Mm -hmm. And you've both been there. What is your What is your experience of what's what this all entails? Yeah, I I have I have family there, and it's um and I so I wrote the Bridget Bishop chapter. She was the first woman executed for witchcraft in the Salem witch trials. And I also wrote a chapter about uh, Dorothy Good, who was a child. She was four years old when she was imprisoned for witchcraft in the 17th century. And it's just, it's, it's a harrowing, it's a harrowing concept that is still relevant to this day. And I think that Salem has a complicated relationship because for a long time they tried to deny the, the witch trials. And then eventually it just they were known as Witch City, and they eventually just embraced it to the point where the police cars have witches on them, and there's witch statues everywhere, and there are witch shops everywhere, and they're actually practicing um, witches in Salem. That was not the case during the witch trials. None of the women who and, and men who were executed were actual witches. They just ran afoul of the people in control. It was all a charade of control. So that factoring into our modern era, it's just a completely complex topic that is born out of people's suffering and an absolutely insane conspiracy against these people that people were wrapped up in such a fervor uh, that, you know, it's 
the damage that was done is so radically different than people getting caught up in believing that a spirit played by an actor was a real spirit. Like, that's harmless fun and entertainment. This led to the concept that witchcraft was all around the Puritans led to mass death in the 1600s. So it's terribly complicated, and I don't have the answer for it. All I can do is talk to you about Bridget Bishop talk to you about Dorothy Good from what we know from historic text about who these people were and continuing to lift up their humanity is a way we can fight against that getting lost in the complication of Salem being a tourism hotspot. So, but with all of that, I want to thank you all for your time and this wonderful conversation. And I hope that you will all check out the Hounded History of Invisible Women. Um, we look forward to your ongoing part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thanks for being with us, Liana. Uh, Andrea, you have more to add about Salem? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's certainly positive aspects to it. I love the way people are reclaiming the symbol of the witch, taking this very disenfranchised, disempowered person and making her a figure of power and of wonder and beauty and so i'm all for it and i don't even as you know i don't even mind supernatural tourism um i think it's a madhouse in october october is not my favorite time to visit salem but i also understand people need to make a living and you know it's it's fine it is complicated it can be, you know, because it can be so kitschy, it can be borderline disrespectful to the actual lives of these women. But I think there's certain places you can seek out in Salem. Um, you know, the there are the graves that you can go to. The memorial is very somber. Um, there's a wonderful company doing walking tours called Now Age in Salem. Instead of New Age, it's Now Age. And they have these very thoughtfully considered small group tours where they, they you know, think about witchcraft and the symbol of the witch in this really wonderful way. Um, you know, so there, there are, again, it's like you are a participant in the system. So the way you choose to approach it makes a difference. And that's a choice that you'll make. I'm not, I'm not against anything. Um, it's actually kind of celebratory in my mind or celebratory in my mind, you know, this, this wonderful reclaiming of this beautiful, powerful, marvelous witch. So, um, yeah, I kind of love and it. And it's, it's, an, it's another example of the power of the story after the person's death. It's just that these deaths were not voluntary, and they were pretty, pretty gruesome and politically motivated, most likely. Yeah. But, uh, again, the power, the staying power, and the effect it can have on people. So it's turned into a symbol of woman power, actually. I think. Right. I mean, we're our, our our country's motto is honestly print the legend, right? I mean, we we love the story, we love the legend so much more than we love facts. And I, you know, these are the things I think that really get deep into our hearts and into our imaginations, and they entrance us and they enthrall us. And I mean, a lot of the stuff that we don't consider about Salem, I think, because this is in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong. I've only found these kind of references in like very academic texts and not in a lot of popular stuff. But, um, you know, this whole idea that the Puritans were so terrified of the Native American population and that a lot of their deep seated fear of witches was actually, you know, part and parcel of their genuine terror of the forests and of the people who lived in this land that they were coming to. And, and they were really scared. And so, it's interesting to me, there's a company up in Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, Bar Harbor Ghost Tours, that brings, it's run by a Native American woman, and it brings a Native American perspective to the conversation. You know, the history of ghosts in this country, people often make the joke that America is built on an Indian burial ground or a Native American burial ground. That's a joke, that's a cliche, but there's some truth to that. And I think that's part of the reason why Americans are very obsessed with ghosts. It's like profound historic knowledge that something here has happened that demands a reckoning. So when I talk about being a responsible consumer, you can also seek out a native owned business, for example, and get that perspective and think about it in these terms as well.